Are we on? All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for um, attending this morning session um, on our collection or online. Now what? This is a panel discussion, part of Festival Retas Budaya, which means which translates to Culture Hack Festival, organized by uh, Guta for the next three days. It's an open cultural data celebration, and it's a, uh, a program of uh, online seminar, workshop, talks, exploring the potential of embracing open access by galleries, libraries, archives, and museum. I'm Anissa Gutom. Uh, I am your moderator for this uh, session. And today we will discuss about after we have our collection online, what, what is next? Making cultural collection online is not the end goal of Open Glam. It is a first step. Open cultural data is one of the tools to help Glam institutions fulfill their mission, reach new audiences, support research activities, and enrich the cultural commons. So, what happens after GLAM collections are online? How can we use open cultural data to make connections and inspire our audiences? Drawing from the experience of various, various cultural heritage institutions in Europe and Asia, this session will explore strategies to connect with audiences using digital means and will address the challenge. The challenges, sorry. Um, with us this morning, uh, we have four amazing people that has been working on or exploring new things in access data for cultural data. Uh, first, uh, there's Francisca Muka from, she's now doing a, a PhD on focusing on co-creation uh, in terms of uh, cultural data. And then later on, we have James Taylor from um, from Auckland War Memorial uh, Museum, and then continued by Madhavi Gandhi from Heritage Lab India, and then from Indonesia, Hilman Handoni, um, a graduate from my university. Um, we will have the discussion in English and in, and in, in Indonesian. Uh, we will provide um, in, in the interpreter for, for Hilman later on. So he will, a, he will present in Indonesia and there will be an interpreter to translate his presentation. So uh, for all participants on YouTube and on uh, Zoom, uh, you can submit your question. Our team will gather uh, your question and deliver it to me. And we will have a session later for a question and answer. So first of all, we would like to invite Francisca to share what she wants to share with us today. Francisca? Do you hear? Okay. Hey, yes, I'm really here. Um, my video is disabled by the host. Okay, so, so let's so let's just um, um, play your um, if you your could video. enable my video. Okay, so Yvonne, maybe we can just uh, play Francisca's uh, uh, presentation video. Hang on one moment. Francisca already prepared presentation through a video for us. So we'll just set it up in a bit. Hi, everyone. I'm happy to present uh, my impulse for the Reiters Budaya Festival today for you. My name is Francisca Mucha and I'm going to share my screen now and show you some slides that are coming straight from my research. My presentation is called Hacking and Remixing, Exploring Co-Creative Uses of Digitized Collections. I'm part of the POEM Research Network. They fund my research project 
Um, it's an EU fund and the network is doing really interesting research. So I can only recommend to check out poem-horizon.eu or follow us on Twitter. Before I started this research project, I worked in a museum, the Historical Museum of Frankfurt. It's a city museum and I worked as curator for digital museum practices. Um, being in a museum that just um, had developed a huge participatory branch, I tried to connect the digital strategy with this participatory approach and develop a strategy that really put the user first or people first and from there build networks, build communities um, with whom we could develop projects together. And then technology would really be in the end of all of this. Being there, um, we took part in one of the Coding Da Vinci hackathons in 2018. We also developed media stations and we developed apps and all kinds of projects. And in the end, I had many questions and I thought, yeah, a research project would actually help me to enlighten some of these, these questions. And so I started in two years ago uh, at the University of Glasgow, my PhD project. Um, and but I found, as probably many of you already know, so many more questions um, and a lot of interesting threads and ideas I'm following up now. And I'm well happy to share some of my ideas, some of my findings with you um, today and happy to discuss them. So first of all, when we talk about museum digital co-creation, there are a few things I want to say before going into the data um, I've collected in my research. So with the rise of digital technologies, um, many museums, many GLAM institutions started to digitize their collections and develop new communication channels, set up social media profiles and develop nice websites. And the idea was basically that by doing this, by using the technology, they would in immediately um, develop a form of participation. But it's not as easy as this. And I think we've learned it in the last 20 years that only because we have these channels, only because this, we have online collections, doesn't necessarily mean that people use them and that we enable participation. So I think it's really important to make a differentiation between access, interaction and participation, where access and interaction are kind of the um, predepositions for participation. So we need this technology, we need these new ways of communication and channels, but in the end, it's not a technological determinism we need the social aspect in it. And also we need to share power. We need to let go of some of the control and um, to actually allow participation in the political sense of it. So I think many museums are still thinking very much from their own logic and ideas and interests. And it would be interesting and also helpful to, you know, turn around this logic and think about what participants would be interested in, what would they like to do with our collections? How are they using collections? Because we already have so many great examples for this. So these are some of the ideas I'm following in my research. And I think these are also really important if we want to go for co-creative forms of participation. And if we want to also let others decide what they want to do with this beautiful heritage we um, steward in our institutions. So um, two examples I found um, and was involved in where people would use um, digitized objects um, were a remix workshop and a hackathon. The hackathon I followed was Coding Da Vinci Westfalen Ruhrgebiet. <laughs> it took place um, last year in the west of Germany in Dortmund. Um, and I did participant observation at the kickoff weekend and at the award ceremony of the hackathon. And I also followed some of the hackathon groups, some of the hackath groups, and we conducted interviews afterwards and there was a survey. So I have all these data on which I'm building here. And then in the Museum of European Cultures in Berlin, um, I developed a remix workshop to which we invited participants to also use digitized objects, but we didn't ask them to actually bring with them programming skills because coding Da Vinci is really so much about coding. And I thought um, it would be interesting to also work with objects in a creative way, but without having to be able to code, because I think sometimes this can be um, quite a barrier for some people. And I think the Reiters Budaya Festival also tries different strands as far as I understood. So what did we learn? What did people say? How did they use objects? 
Um, now trying to change this perspective. Uh, first of all, um, when people choose objects or choose a data set they want to work with, um, there's an interesting thinking behind this. And one participant put it in this way. The question is always what to do with this old data. You don't just look at them because they are 100 years old. You look at them to see what was discussed 100 years ago and what can you take from it. So there is an idea about actualization and about seeing what is still relevant, about learning from history and about making a connection between the past and the present and then also about the future in a way. So I find this connection and this approach as first step of choosing a data set really an interesting one. Then once you start working with this data, of course, there are more aspects that come into this process. It's a quite complicated process. And one participant describes it in this way. At the start, there's always the task or problem or even the content that's available, which is then finally merged with our expertise. So here is a combination between the content, which is digitized collections, clam collections that is available in hackathons and the Remix workshop, and then the expertise, the skill set that people bring with them allows them to work with it, allows them to open up this data and to see a way what they can do with it, see like developing ideas. And once they've started this process, um, it's a really interesting engagement with data that is far from what CLAM professionals usually say when they kind of make a differentiation between the original, the authentic original, and the digitized one that can never reach the original. Quite in contrast, um, as one participant puts, at the same time, you can experience these data centrally again and again. You look at them, you work with the pictures or with the sounds. On the other hand, you have this constructive and creative effect. So this participant describes the process almost as like an essential perception of data, a kind of diving into data, which is repetitive. You can do it again and again. And then you also have a creative and constructive process with this data. So almost describing it as a form of materiality um, that has its own characteristics that can be used. Um, and then what you do to describe this process a bit more in an abstract way is, um, as one participant put it, extending uh, the means of communication. So uh, this participant said, in principle, it is already a means of communication and you can continue to do so. It is already a form of story medium, just like film. So in the Remix workshop, we developed in the end stop motion films and that's by this participant pointed towards the medium of film. But more importantly, and this description points to the characteristic of the object and also the digitization of it, that is a means of communication. It's a medium, a story medium. And um, this can be extended through creative practices. The last quote I'm bringing to you sums up this whole process a bit more. So this participant said, uh, we had the time and the motivation and the possibility to take part, uh, to take the museum object out of context and then put it back. And then with that act, still create a little bit like an own museum, like a mirror of the same object, but a more personal one. So digitization then in turns allows to take objects out of the context, for example, out of the context of the museum display or the online collection, and then allowing opening it for personal interpretations of the object, for memories, for associations, for reflections, for questions that through a creative process can be put back into the object and like create a new remix of both the old object and your own mirror, your personal mirror of the object. 
So coming to the end and trying to find a conclusion, co-creative uses of cultural heritage are quite diverse and different. And they can be learning from history, they can be about merging content with expertise, perceiving data with your senses, extending communication and creating a personal mirror. And how people approach digitized objects or which of these strategies they use is really dependent on their own personal perspective, on the motivation they bring with them, on their skill set and their background, um, on the context of the whole event. Um, and all these aspects um, define what then can be done with cultural objects with digitized heritage. So it's really hard for institutions to anticipate this. And I think the only way to reach a co-creative um, form in which we share a bit of power is actually opening up and allowing all these different ways of seeing and using objects um, to happen. And this is maybe just the last slide that can also be then used in our discussion. I got a really nice question on Twitter um, about um, some of these um, quotes I shared. Um, and this Twitter friend said, in your sketch and text, some people are missing, which are essential for co-creation in my understanding. Below the equator, there are no glam folks and above the hackers, there are no users. And that's an interesting point because as you can see in the scribbling on the downside of my slide, um, the creative process is a quite complicated and messy one. There's a fuzzy front end in which you involve a small group of people to co-create with you. This cannot be a huge group. It's, pro it's usually a small group, but then in the end, something is developed that can be used by many more. And this is also what you can see in the pyramid by Pille Pullman, Fengerfeld and Pille Rune. They differentiate between participants, users, visitors, audience, and the public. And I think all of them have to take, have to be considered when we think about co-creation with digital collections and ways of opening up our collections. Thank you so much. I have some references here um, and well, always happy to discuss and looking forward to the discussion in the panel now. Thank you. Thank you, Francisca. Um, We'll just continue with the next presentation from James. Hi, James. Okay, I'll yep, I'll share my screen. All right, I did it to it. Thank you. Um, and let's just, whoops, um, Okay, kia ora, kia ora koutou. Um, Thank you so much for uh, allowing me the chance to, to join you this evening. Uh, my name is James Taylor. I'm the Online Collections Information and Partnership Manager at Tamaki Paenga Hira Auckland War Memorial Museum. Um, I'm the product owner for our collections online at the museum, um, and I'm also responsible for the various partnerships that we have uh, and that we use to push our open collection data and imagery out across the internet, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, just before I begin, just a few quick details about uh, Auckland Museum. So we're based in Aotearoa, New Zealand's largest city, Auckland, for a population of about 1.5 million people. Uh, the museum is one of the largest glam institutions in the country, uh, and we have an encyclopedic collection um, across most uh, time periods um, and cultures. Uh, we have around 4 million objects in the collection, uh, with three main collecting areas, human history, natural sciences, and documentary heritage. Uh, the museum's uh, vision is to enrich lives and to inspire discoveries, connecting through shared stories of people, lands and seas. And one of the ways that we can do this is by unleashing our open collections. Uh, just a little bit of context around the journey that we took to get to, on, to, to, get to our open collections. Uh, Auckland Museum had had records online since 2004, but the, the journey to, the, to open collections didn't begin until uh, 2015 with the launch of a revamped collections online. So some of the key sort of parts of this um, philosophically and policy wise, we um, had default CC by licensing of collection data and imagery. Um, we had a really important rule, which is our collections are open as a rule, but enclosed by exception. And what this means is that 
While we have a defa default CC BY um, policy for most of the collection objects, we balance this with a custom filtering system, which in some cases removes access to certain data and images. This works in conjunction with our cultural permission policy to ensure that we have the kind of the correct handling and usage of our Taonga, Māori and Pacific collections. Uh, we also filter out some natural science data, particularly around the locations of, in, of endangered species. But in general, we try to make as much material that's available in our collection management systems available to the public as well. Finally, we like really strongly encourage the use and reuse of collections, uh, trying to make it as friction free as possible for users. So as well as the CC by licensing, we have an open API, which, which people can use. And we also make full resolution collection photography available to download. Um, alongside this was a sort of more informal mindset. And it's a really basic one, but I think it really helps um, to kind of set the scene. And that's basically just to release the data to get out of the way. We want to make it as easy as possible for users to access, to download and to reuse the open collections. So the main strategy uh, that I'm going to talk to you about today is around our use of partnerships and around uh, external platforms. So these have been key to amplifying the reach of our, of our open collections, and we have strong institutional support for this, as you can see. Um, it was a strategic priority last year and the last financial year to grow local and global audiences um, through using, through sharing collections and aggregating them. And there was a couple of KPIs uh, that I had to meet as well, which is three new partnerships per year and a million engagements per month. So this slide shows uh, basically the web of the of the collections partnerships of the external partnerships that we have um, that we have developed in the last four or five years at the museum. So we work with aggregators, with research portals, data repositories, and other platforms to share our collections and to connect, to connect with their users. So what this means is that what we're trying to do is we're trying to go where users are rather than expecting them to come to us. They can sorry, connect yes. with them. Sorry. Sorry, Hello. can you uh, yeah. speak a little bit slower? Because we have uh, oh. Indonesian interpreters. And oh, sure thing, to, sure. Yeah, this is also to remind the Indonesian audience, if you prefer to hear it in Indonesian, you can you can click you can click on the uh, on your Zoom, okay? There's an interpretation, and then you you choose the channel the channel for Korean. It's for Indonesian, but this, on the system it says Korean. So, yeah, so please. Okay, sorry, my, uh, my apologies. No problem. Cool. Um, so what this means is that we are trying to go where our users, where users are rather than expecting them to come to us and rather than expecting them to come to the Auckland Museum website. They can connect with our collections without knowing anything about us. Um, and I'll show a few examples of this um, shortly. The other important uh, sort of rationale behind this is it allows us to um, exploit the features and the technologies of these other websites and focus our own internal development efforts on high value features rather than replicating services elsewhere. And I'll talk about that again shortly as well. So I think when we talk about these uh, various platforms that we use, it's quite useful to distinguish between different types of, different types of platforms. There are those that we actively curate versus those that uh, we have a more passive approach towards. When I say passive, I mean uh, that we provide bulk or um, bulk regular or one-off sort of data uploads to them, or they call our API um, or data that's available on other sites. What's interesting here is not only a difference in the effort and resource required on our side, because as you can imagine, curating, um, curating sets of photos and data takes a lot more time than just doing a bulk upload. Um, but it also results in quite a different user experience and I think um, quite an interesting user experience when you think about it. So on the screen at the moment are some examples of platforms where we actively curate uh, collection content. So we have collections and exhibitions on Google Arts. Uh, we have uh, paintings on the watercolor world. We have a Pinterest account, which our collection staff member runs and curates. And we also have around two and a half thousand um, of the very best uh, collection imagery that we've photographed over the last five years. This is a really arty, beautiful collection photography that our um, uh, collection imaging team has, has produced uh, in the last little while. So having, having the collections on these different platforms gives us the ability to reach different diverse audiences. 
So this is an example of a handbag on collections online um, and also on Pinterest and Flickr. So the thing is, from a user's point of view, you may know absolutely nothing about Auckland Museum. You could be in Indonesia or you could be in Vietnam or you could be in the United States, but you're interested in a certain designer or a certain era of fashion. You search that and you can come across objects from our collections. What I think is also interesting is that there's a sort of contradiction here. So these platforms that we curate usually take uh, more time and resource to update and to, to kind of keep the content fresh. But what it means is that it results in a more passive user experience. So these sites are usually just sort of flipped through and browse on your cell phone. Um, but they do provide long-term value. They can highlight collections in ways that we can't on our own website. So here's uh, Google Arts as an example. Again, a purse from our collection. This is a very macabre object from our collection. It's actually a purse that's made from an albatross foot. And what we've done in the last month is developed a, a Google Arts exhibition with the exhibition team, which has an audio tour with audio provided by one of our curators. And there's uh, the foot again on as an object in of itself in Google Arts. Using these platforms and using these different partner websites also means that we can leverage the features that are on these platforms. So Flickr, of course, is one of the main photography um, sharing platforms on the internet. It presents photography you know, in an absolutely beautiful way. Um, users can download the full high resolution images that we produce from our Twitter account. But um, what we've also done is used Flickr's API um, and hooked that into um, a Google Chrome extension. We developed this over the, Chrome, uh, over the first COVID lockdown here in New Zealand. So we're pulling from the Flickr, we're pulling our own collection of images from Flickr using the Flickr API into a Google Chrome new tab extension. And when this is installed, users are greeted with this beautiful collection of photography and new tabs. And what it means is it's another way and it's another place that people can access um, our collections at Auckland Museum. So on the other hand, uh, there are also platforms that we don't curate. As I said, these, these are the sort of the more passive approach that we take. So these instead take open data and imagery at a much larger scale and involve bulk data uploads or calling our API to take whole collections. Um, some of these websites include the Biodiversity Portals, uh, Atlas of Living Australia and GBIF. A uh, key partner for us um, as well here in New Zealand is the Digital New Zealand, which aggregates uh, digitised uh, digitized collections from a whole range of New Zealand glam institutions. Uh, and we also contribute out of copyright books to the Biodiversity Heritage Library. While, while this sort of work involves less work for us compared to the curated platforms, um, the, the user experience is again quite different. And what it means is, in general terms, the user is actually more directly engaged with this content. Uh, so on these platforms, our collections are used for various forms of research and we get significantly higher view counts. And again, um, once our content is available on these aggregators, these can kind of act as multipliers and huge amplifiers of the reach and the range of our collections, um, not only because of their own audiences, but they can also be reused on other, on other platforms. So one example from this is data from GBIF, which is used on Bionomia to match collectors to scientific species, which I'm sure um, Siobhan Leachman, who I think is talking later on today, will, will have a bit more to say about. Um, but what's crucial here is not only is the data that we've uploaded to GBIF being completely independently used um, on a different website, but it's actually allowing us to measure the research impact of our natural sciences collections in new ways as well. So we get something out of that. We get something out of that, even though we've not really had anything directly to do with the Bionomia project. Uh, so the biggest multiplier of them all, of course, is the various Wikimedia Foundation platforms. In the last five years, we've had over 170,000 images uploaded to Wikimedia via our API. And this has been done almost completely by volunteers who are totally unconnected with the museum. So here you can see some of the ways that volunteers have then used these images that are available on Wikimedia. So we have pages with um, British Army uniforms. We have a um, uh, New Zealand Labour politician uh, doing a campaign speech and we also have the really random stuff that appears on Wikipedia so there's some green green bottles illustrating green bottles. Um, so this is another example of these engaged users reusing collections that we've opened up and in turn using these to connect with users across the globe and the numbers that we get for Wikipedia beyond really what could have been imagined a decade or so ago. We now have content on over 1,400 pages and 103 different languages. So it's a massive, global, multilingual reach compared to our own collections online. And all of that work has 
almost entirely been done by volunteers that we're, that we're not connected to. We haven't directed that work at all. So I've talked about these sort of various different platforms. What is the, the net result of all of this? And keep in mind that I mentioned we had a KPI of a million engagements per month in the last financial year. And so this slide gives us some indication of the result. I mentioned that KPI, and as you can see, that was easily met. But in a way, these sort of these big dumb numbers don't really matter. What matters, as you can see, is how the reach of the collections can be massively amplified. The, the number that's been highlighted in yellow there, those are the views of collection objects on our own collections online on our own website, around half a million. So it's a decent number, but that is just absolutely dwarfed by the combined numbers of the different partnerships, which is over a 4,000% increase. Of course, we've got Wikipedia contributing to the majority of this, um, but we can also see um, Digital New Zealand and ALA, and um, even Flickr and Pinterest sort of a net, uh, well, Flickr, Pinterest, I should say, does big collections online and Flickr is coming up close as well. So by, by leveraging our partnerships and by sh sharing these collections, collections data and imagery across these multiple platforms, we can engage at a real scale with both a local and a global audience online. So, you know, again, those numbers are great, um, particularly for annual reporting, but here's some examples of actual use that people have made of the collections um, from the last couple of months. So I've, I mentioned Siobhan Leachman earlier. Here's, a, here's some of the sort of amazing work that she's been doing across a range of projects. And it's an example of a Wikidata network that she's derived from her work using open collections. Um, we had some awesome feedback from a locked down student in the United States who was using our herbar herbarium sheets to, um, to do their work while they couldn't get into the lab. Uh, we had a plant that was um, identified in Pitcairn Island, which was thought to be long extinct, and that was based using data that we have in GBIV. And then in the corner, we have someone that's basically taken a high-res um, image of one of our collection objects and used it to recreate an object, uh, to recreate an artwork that was going to be too expensive for them to buy at auction. So just briefly, some of the challenges that we face, um, I'll, I'll go over these quite quickly, but one of the first ones is around, I think, um, a shift to becoming open adjacent. So I've mentioned earlier our cultural permissions policy. Um, we've been massively inspired by the open glam movement, but we are starting to have a bit of a pause and a think about where and how we move in this space. We have a unique bicultural context in New Zealand. And while we support the open glam principles, we need to balance these out with our obligations uh, under the Treaty of Waitangi here uh, and, and our to, to operate in partnership with Māori. This means that not everything in our collection can be openly licensed, not everything is up for grab, and we need to respect the wishes of the people um, who are connected to these collection objects to make sure that, um, that their sort of authority is, is upheld. We also have a large Pacifica um, population in Auckland, and so we work in a similar way with them. So my colleagues, Victoria and Zoe, took over the Open Glam account uh, late last year with a bit of a tweet storm, and I've written up a couple of articles on Medium around this. Uh, one way that we're considering approaching some of these some of these difficulties is by the use of traditional knowledge labels. Uh, so these would sit alongside Creative Commons and copyright licenses. Uh, and in particular, what we're looking at at the moment is how to recognise the mana and the authority um, of endemic and indigenous scientific species. We're also at the very start of the journey to understand issues around data sovereignty and indigenous data sovereignty. So this is a kind of meaningless diagram, but what is a diagram of the architecture of our own collections online? And you'll notice that there's a bunch of uh, Amazon services that we use. I think in an era of questions around privacy and the moral and ethical actions of big tech, we really need to examine how comfortable we are um, with, with our data in their hands and what potential alternatives there are. Uh, following on from the discussion of uh, co-creation, but you know we're looking at how we can leverage the work that volunteers and citizen scientists are doing with our collections on the various platforms. You know, how can we move towards a co-creative approach? How can we bring this work that's done uh, on Wikipedia and Wikidata into our own collections online? Um, I think Wikidata in particular has some great potential here. And just finally, um, one step that we've taken recently is trying to, to trying to be a bit more transparent and open in our own work. So we've recently updated our website with our long-term roadmaps and our wiki work plan. And we'd really like to encourage other institutions to do the same so that we can share and learn about what we're doing across the GLAM sector. So look, just to briefly conclude, uh, today I've talked about 
uh, how at Auckland Museum we use partnerships across a range of websites and platforms and portals to amplify the reach of our collections. By using both curated content and bulk uploads, we go where users are rather than expecting them to come to us. Um, and doing so, access, access to the museum's collection is no longer limited by a geography, borders, or even language. We can reach users in multiple ways, we can inspire discovery, and we can connect our collections to diverse global audiences. I've chucked some references in, um, into a Google document, so those will be available soon, as will the slides. Um, if anyone wants to get in touch with me, I'm more than happy to uh, have a further discussion over email. Thank you very much. Thank you, James. That's a very insightful presentation. I will be very interested to discuss later in terms of the co-creation because <clears throat> between you and Francisca, you're uh, touching the, the subject of co-creation, but I see there's, um, there's something interesting related to the cultural permission policy and all of this. So that would that uh, we will discuss further um, later on the in the question and answer um, session. So we'll just continue with Madafi. Are you ready? Yes, absolutely. Um, here I am. All right. So. Thank you. Thank you for having me, and it's great to be here. I'll start with um, sharing my screen as well. Um, so, um, yeah, right here talking about uh, open collections and their uses and James and Francisca have given us some really inspiring things to think about. Uh, I'm going to talk about what the Heritage Lab um, did in working with open collections of DAG museums. Um, but before that, I'd just like to begin with sharing um, a little about in general, how culture is perceived and uh, cultural heritage and, and the way it is always thought about as something that belonged to the past. But the idea of co-creation, of digital participation, of even using digital is, is to find a way to open up uh, thousands and millions of artworks. Are people going to be able to use all of them effectively? Are they going to be able to? And moreover, are we ready? Um, is it easy? Is it difficult uh, to put everything online and then you know, sort of distribute it effectively as well? So keeping all of those things in mind, all of those challenges, we decided that let's take the first baby step and just open up limited artworks and just let's see what comes out of it. Um, it was in, in, important to understand that was, what is the need that we are fulfilling since people do find art online on Pinterest and on um, Facebook and Twitter and social media, how, how would it matter to them if something would be completely open and accessible? Um, what we saw was not just during the gift challenge that people were downloading and creating gifts, but we were also seeing, as, as I, I'll talk about it later on in the slides again, um, that it think about 3D collections of, of someone DM to me saying, can we do coloring sheets with these? Would you do these? And we're like, yeah, okay, maybe that's a great idea. We'll come up with something. So, so that, that, that would be to understand what are the needs of the audience. An important thing was also to understand what prevents people from discovering these collections. One thing would be that, um, okay, that they're not easily discoverable. And as James also stated in his presentation, that it's important to sort of make sure that they are distributed well and they're across platforms. The other thing would be, how easy is it for people to just download that? Um, a lot of times we during the gift challenge, we encountered um, messages that asked us that, oh, we cannot download something on Flickr from our phone. And that was odd because, I mean, you can just go on to Flickr and download. And we realized, okay, there might be an issue with just saving something from the phone. Um, in the interface might be different. But a lot of times collections may not, uh, I mean, museums may put up open collections saying things like uh, sign in to download, create an account to download, those factors could be um, you know, difficult for someone who's just looking to download it for a quick purpose maybe, that, that could be a factor. Um, but also something that um, influences reuse is how people see other people reusing it and what the various possibilities can be that could inspire a lot of people. And also to understand, uh, just as DAG tried to understand, the museum tried to understand what the digital participation culture really is like in India. 
uh, because in India we have spent a lot of time even engaging people with uh, the museum, the, the pre-pandemic time when people were encouraged to come to the museum and you know, just visit it. So we do we do face a challenge when it comes to a uh, visiting museums culture. So digital participation culture building that has also been one of the things that we've uh, really had to work on. Um, and, and just um, as, as um, James mentioned that it's important to distribute collections. Now this is the thing that when we look at, um, you know, finding a platform like uh, Unsplash, for example, to upload open collections, we automatically also start to appear on um, the integrations that Unsplash already has. So be it a Trello background or be it um, a stock image for an Adobe Spark video, or whether it is uh, for a medium post, now that Unsplash is also growing. The idea is also for museums to think of these um, integrations independently, perhaps. Um, API is a great way over there, but I mean, we just have 13, collect, 13 um, artworks open. So our, our approach has been to find different kind of partners and different kind of platforms to make the discovery of um, the collection easier and finding spaces for promoting these. Um, so we don't really know how people can, the millions of ways that people can actually use these open collections. The, the operating framework that we are talking about right now, the current climate with all of these platforms like a Giphy of course, but like TikTok and Instagram, everybody that we engage with, the general public that the museum's open to, everybody they engage with is a potential content creator. So our hope for making these collections actively usable is to reach them to this potential content creator, to use them. So this is a screenshot for Snapchat. And um, there's of course Adobe, uh, the, uh, sorry, there's of course um, uh, Spark AR, which is the Instagram filter creation um, tool. Can open collections be used by creators who are using these tools effectively to create lenses, filters? Um, and, and how will that sort of impact the museum? That's that's like um, that's always like a question. And how does this impact the glam uh, institution as such? But it's like we said, it's keeping the culture alive. Like if it's reworked, if it's remixed, it's important to see the kind of conversations that um, sort of arise from it, as Francisca also pointed out in her presentation. <clears throat> This is exactly why DAG even hosted uh, Give It Up. Because as a museum, they're, they're a recent museum. DAG as an institution has existed for really long. Uh, but DAG Museums is a new initiative. And their concept and their idea was to enable a creator hub. So looking at that, I think Give It Up tied up really well with their goals because they were enabling a creator community to come together to use their resources and create something new. And um, that's how <clears throat> we expected that, you know, people would create lots of gifts. And yes, then we'll put it up on Giphy thanks to Europeana because we were collaborating with Europeana who hosts the Global Challenge. And uh, that people would be able to use these gifts in everyday conversation on WhatsApp, on chat, everywhere went to the gift channel. Um, what we didn't know is that, I mean, we did an end of, um, you know, we did a survey at the end and we realized that this is something that we didn't really expect um, was an impact that we were creating. This is, might have been something that we planned subcon subconsciously, but it really uh, took us by surprise as well that there were a lot of people who were first time makers. And this gives an interesting uh, you know, approach that again, going back to the whole creator community um, approach, that the museum could be seen as a hub to create uh, opportunities for learning, for digital learning and exchanges. Because um, in India, we are very used to hosting art workshops. So like you see the artwork in the museum and then you're taught how to create the same thing with a similar technique by uh, someone who practices that particular craft right now. Um, so that's a very common practice that we have. But just reimagining this in the digital scenario, um, 
so for example this cat um, created by jamini roy one of the artists who was influenced by the folk art the patua folk art form a uh, museum might be hosting a patua folk art form drawing um, a drawing workshop it's also interesting if the museum starts hosting gift workshops which now dag is actively pursuing opportunities to um, share digital skills as well with their community uh, so that was definitely an impact and now that our collection a small part of our collection is open we also realized in the survey that a lot of people are going to use it for educational purposes for um, you know gifting or different kind of things so we are looking at how museum the museum can provide for these to be used um, like can we can we give uh, can we can we do a hackathon related to um, creating wall prints can we do a hackathon i mean so we have collaborated and we have looked for potential collaborators in partner um, events such as hack for glam or different kind of platforms which i will again talk about in a bit um what we also realized with open collections is that this is something that personally was a favorite when we sort of tried to take in the impact of give it up that the people um i mean this is the real impact i would say because during a pandemic if a museum by simply opening their collections and enabling people to do something with them is uh, creating an opportunity for surprise or joy and such emotions i think that's definitely a big win uh for any glam institution uh so yeah i mean we are looking for different kind of collaborators different kind of platforms to sort of provide these things for not uh, across media types and medium so it necessarily uh, doesn't have to be an ar filter which is a digital product uh, but it can also be something tangible like coloring sheets for children so different kind of opportunities and different kind of media types is what uh, open collections can really lead to for different um, age groups uh, so this is something that arunesh varade actually um, created during the hack for glam event so the hack for glam event during the creative commons summit was an excellent opportunity to put in the dag collections also um, even during europeana's uh, global gift it up challenge uh, dag lent its 13 artworks to be gifted up by a broader global audience and during hack for glam as well and um, a painting suddenly became a 3d object that you could use around so i think it's it's great if um, glam institutions can find these similar partners um, like kratas budaya for example would have been a great partner maybe next time we'll figure out a way uh, but uh, but yeah the idea is to let anybody around the world engage with your collections create something and inspire you with it um so yeah in in, in case i'm looking forward to um, in engaging with all of you but in case you want to get in touch later those are the coordinates and um, yeah i'm looking forward to the discussion later on thank you Thank you Madafi. So um that's very interesting. I I specifically like the the cat. Um So let's continue with uh, Hilman, are you ready? Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. A very good day to everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh it's an honor for me to be here with honorable panel. uh the presentation was insightful and lovely and i hope that i can complete it then uh ka ifon i do have slides of presentation too okay okay uh let me start uh next slide please okay ma uh, introduction i'm hilman head of research and education of the perdongeng we have partnered with the national museum since 2013 on the program we can at the national museum with theater coma theater coma is uh, an indonesian renowned theater company a pro this program use uh, theater as an approach to the museum um uh, also an independent podcast produ producer and maybe that's why the committee invited me but please allow me to present my ideas in bahasa for those who need it uh, simultaneous translation is available just uh, hit the translation button to the korean button 
Uh, okay. Uh, next, please. Uh, well, next, uh, Kak Ivan. Oke, okay. podcast is great. Tahun depan industri ini bernilai 1 juta, uh, miliar dolar, padahal 5 tahun lalu nilainya cuma 70 dolar saja. Facebook dan YouTube sedang merancang platform dan atau berusaha mengintegrasikan layanan mereka dengan pengalaman podcast. Google juga katanya berkomitmen untuk meningkatkan discoverability podcast di box uh, pencarian mereka. Dalam survei terbaru di Indonesia, dalam sepekan yang lalu, hampir 80 persen responden dalam sebuah studi. Sebuah studi disebutkan bahwa seminggu yang lalu mereka sudah mendengarkan podcast. Artinya podcast semakin populer juga di Indonesia. Dan saya melihat tidak ada alasan museum tidak ikut memproduksi. Hampir semua museum besar melakukan ini, dan kalau tadi kita melihat presentasi bagaimana uh, apa, koleksi museum itu dipadu-padankan, mungkin menggunakan teknologi yang agak rumit, sebaliknya podcast rasanya sih murah dan mudah untuk diproduksi. Podcast juga tertulis di DNA kita karena uh, kita besar dengan tradisi lisan yang kental dan dongeng sebelum tidur. Next, please. Uh, Ibu kita berdendang dan mengajak kita berbicara sejak kita masih dalam kandungan. Saat kita belum berbicara, apalagi berbahasa, kita sudah mencuri dengar, menyimak gosip-gosip terbaru, cerita-cerita tetangga yang ajaib. Podcast juga menawarkan fleksibilitas konsumsi. Orang yang commuting misalkan, berkendara, berbersih rumah, bisa mendengarkan, dan podcast juga singkatnya bisa membawa museum ke telinga pendengar. Mereka yang tak punya waktu, tinggal jauh dari museum, atau malas membaca, atau jenuh dengan uh, media sosial, dengan budaya visual, bisa kemudian menutup matanya sejenak dan mendengarkan suara-suara, cerita-cerita ajaib, dan seterusnya. Nah, ringkasnya podcast mungkin bisa jadi salah satu jawaban untuk pertanyaan panitia. Our collection or are online, now what? Ya, mungkin bisa dibikin podcast. Nah, uh, pot, uh, paparan saya tadi semoga tidak diartikan sebagai glorifikasi terhadap podcast. Saya sadar akan keterbatasannya, meski sekali podcast atau dalam spektrum yang lebih luas ya, radio atau audio, itu ditantang. Pernah kita mendengar lirik video kill the radio star, televisi, mesin cetak, bahkan internet juga datang, konon datang untuk menantang, tapi audio atau podcast malah menemukan kembali momentumnya. Uh, podcast misalkan tidak bisa dipadupadankan seperti yang ditampilkan dalam presentasi-presentasi tadi ya, tidak bisa dibuatkan interaktifnya, mungkin tidak akan pernah jadi meme yang powerful atau dipadupadankan menjadi seni instalasi, grafis di tembok ten, melihat koleksi secara langsung, tapi mendengar cerita-cerita dari podcast mungkin akan memicu imajinasi dan menimbulkan apa yang kita sebut sebagai theater of mind. Dengan segala keterbatasan dan kekurangan itu, juga dari pengalaman saya sebagai jurnalis radio dan produser podcast, juga seorang musiolog, masih dalam proses, maka ini adalah beberapa catatan saya. Slide berikutnya. Uh, podcast ini untuk siapa? Apakah untuk anak-anak orang dewasa? Apakah untuk akademisi atau bapak rumah tangga? Mereka yang commuting atau beristirahat di rumah? Beberapa podcast bahkan uh, durasinya disesuaikan dengan uh, waktu, pan uh, panjangnya waktu yang kita habiskan commuting, menjadi 20 menitan misalkan. Atau kalau konteks Jakarta bisa 30 menit, bisa 60 menit karena kemacetan yang uh, melanda. Nah, Uh, untuk anak kecil, mungkin podcast berdurasi singkat jadi pilihan. Dan dari pengalaman saya, banyak museum juga membuat podcast ini ya khusus untuk kalangannya sendiri atau dikonsumsi oleh kalangan internal, mereka yang bergerak dalam bidang kebudayaan atau menaruh pada minat bidang kebudayaan, atau untuk orang dewasa. Orang dewasa juga kan harusnya bisa kita detailkan. Orang dewasa seperti apa? Laki-laki atau perempuan? Karena ini semua akan menentukan personality podcast kita. 
kita mau menuturkan podcast ini seperti apa sih? Nah, drive dari luar itulah yang mungkin akan berguna untuk kita. Poin kedua yang ingin saya sampaikan adalah kolaborasi. Ini sudah sering tadi disebut dalam presentasi sebelumnya, bukan karena sok-sokan berfilosofi, tapi karena kesadaran bahwa museum juga punya keterbatasan. Sementara medium audio itu punya gramatika dan estetikanya sendiri yang mungkin tidak dikuasai museum. Untuk itulah kolaborasi diperlukan agar podcast paling tidak tidak terdengar amatir lah. Saya tidak bermaksud mengatakan bahwa podcast itu harus diproduksi dengan standar tertinggi. Museum bisa belajar, museum yang punya sumber daya bisa menggandeng rumah produksi. Ini misalkan dilakukan Museum Guggenheim yang berkolaborasi dengan 99% Invisible Podcast. Sementara yang buat yang memiliki keterbatasan ya berkolaborasi dengan komunitas atau produser independen atau museum misalkan bisa menyediakan hasil riset penelitinya, kuratornya, atau sumber daya lainnya, uh, misalkan mungkin kok apa membuka studio bersama bisa dijadikan alternatif. Studio bersama ini bisa dipakai oleh siapapun yang ingin membuat podcast di museum. Yang ketiga adalah uh, be specific, be nice, be different, be nice, be, be different. Ada podcast untuk anak-anak yang dirancang untuk didengarkan sembari sikat gigi, durasinya cuma 2 menit, e, comper. Ada juga podcast yang terbit setiap jam 3 pagi, dibuat oleh seorang ibu yang terbangun pada pukul 3 pagi, karena bayinya bangun jam segitu dan dibuat untuk orang tua yang bernasib sama. E, podcast saya misalkan tergantung pada kata itu disusun dengan pendekatan e, sosial, sosiolinguistik, berdurasi 5, 5 menitan, dan syukurnya sih lebih dari 90% mendengarnya mendengarkan sampai habis. E, Podcast museum atau podcast sejarah itu banyak sekali, luar biasa banyak. Uh, tapi pernahkah kita mendengarkan kalau kaleng Coca-Cola misalkan di interview mengenai sejarahnya atau uh, selembar koran terbitan di masa lalu disuruh menceritakan perasaannya? Nah, boleh jadi masa depan podcast itu ada di dalam pilihan yang amat spesifik, sangat, sangat sempit, sangat, sangat niche dan berbeda itu. Yang keempat adalah go local. Uh, Jorogon Experience yang kita punya adaptasinya di sini menjadi dari Corbuzer itu mungkin menginvasi Eropa. Uh, podcast Michelle Obama tenar di India. Uh, tren global memang perlu dilihat oleh pengelola museum atau produser podcast, tapi harap diingat juga ciri khas atau lokalitas di Indonesia. Podcast yang populer di sini itu bergenre komedi dan horor. Di sini suara kicau burung untuk melatih burung kicau itu bisa jadi konten dan punya pendengar. Di Amerika dan Eropa podcast itu dikonsumsi saat commuting. Tapi di sini podcast dikonsumsi pada malam hari, menjelang tidur dan di akhir pekan. Di sana personality atau status selebritas itu jadi faktor penting. Tapi di sini tenaran pribadi adalah faktor yang hampir tidak dipertimbangkan dalam pemasaran atau meraih podcast pendengar podcast yang baru. Dan akhirnya kembali mengulangi apa yang telah saya sampaikan di depan, kita juga harus menerima bahwa podcast juga punya keterbatasan. Podcast harus diletakkan dalam bingkai besar yang namanya transmedia storytelling. Uh, inilah yang mesti dikuasai museum. Museum sebagai produser harus punya bayangan bahwa sebuah materi ini bisa diolah menjadi foto stories, meme, gif, tadi TikTok, komik, animasi, dan akhirnya apa yang cocok buat medium uh, podcast. Tapi ini lagi-lagi bukan untuk mengecilkan nilai podcast. Sebagai bukti bahwa Hollywood sudah lama melirik podcast untuk mengatasi kekurangan cerita. Netflix juga baru-baru ini mengubah sebuah podcast menjadi docu-series. Podcast ini jadi semacam benih lah ya, semacam uh, apa tunas yang bisa bertumbuh, berkembang, menjadi macam-macam. Dan terakhir adalah soal prinsip slide berikutnya. Slide berikutnya Mbak Yvonne. Uh, terakhirnya ada soal prinsip. Ada tiga hal pokok yang ingin saya tekankan. Yang pertama adalah membuat podcast seperti halnya membuat video mapping, uh, AR, VR, dan macam-macam. Mungkin terdengar cool banget, keren banget. Uh, tapi buat apa? Buat siapa? Apakah podcast ini bermanfaat untuk menghadapi perubahan iklim? 
problem kebodohan massal misalkan atau problem ketimpangan atau dunia yang sedang terbelah yang ditunjukkan di pemilu Amerika sehari-hari ini atau fundamentalisme dan kekerasan. Karena itu menurut saya podcast museum juga sepatutnya menjawab tantangan-tantangan pokok yang sedang kita hadapi. Hanya dengan menjawab tantangan-tantangan pokok inilah podcast sebagaimana museum bisa menemukan relevansinya. Dan kalau tidak, podcast hanya akan jadi proyek buang-buang uang yang percuma. Pokok yang kedua yang ingin saya tekankan, ya kembali lagi museum harus menjadi museum museumnya warga. Dan itu artinya museum harus berbagi otoritasnya dan dalam menjaga dan mengelola warisan budaya bersama warga. Inilah yang terjadi antara Museum Nasional dan Dapur Dongeng, misalkan saat kolaborasi dan sharing authority itu terjadi, lahirlah akhir pekan di Museum Nasional bersama Teater Koma. Dan hingga kini sudah ada 33, hampir 35 cerita asli yang kita kembangkan dari koleksi museum. 30, 30-an cerita yang jika dikembangkan, itu bisa jadi universe-nya sendiri. Bisa jadi dokumenter, bisa jadi cerita panjang animasi, bisa jadi komik, bisa jadi game, bisa jadi sandiwara radio. Dan kebetulan ini yang sedang kami lakukan, kami sedang menggarap sandiwara Samariona untuk adaptasi program akhir pekan di Museum Nasional karena kita tidak bisa mempertunjukkan teater di tengah-tengah kerumunan. Dan dengan itu, saya menutup presentasi saya dengan mengatakan bahwa storytelling ini adalah darahnya museum, dan museum dianugerahi dengan keberlimpahan cerita. Dalam pengalaman saya meriset uh, untuk program akhir pekan di Museum Nasional, sebuah artefak itu bisa saja memiliki lebih dari satu cerita, lebih dari satu mitos, dan lebih dari satu legenda. Bayangkan, ada berapa banyak cerita yang bisa dibuat dan lebih topnya lagi, lebih kerennya lagi adalah museum nggak perlu khawatir pengulangan tema karena hampir nggak ada museum yang punya koleksi persis yang sama. Karena itulah keterampilan dalam menuturkan cerita menjadi sangat esensial dan itulah PR besar museum kita sekarang paling tidak di Indonesia. Terima kasih Kakak Ica, semoga bermanfaat. Salam. Baik. Okay, terima kasih Mas Hilman. Thank you Hilman for your interesting um, presentation, especially that part about the podcast. Having podcast is not about being cool, uh, but it is kind of cool. Um, I see uh, we finished the all four presentation and I see there's one connecting um, topic in, uh, in between all four of you. It's about the... Um, it's about the participation, who is doing it. While Francisca is, is um, elegantly showed this beautiful triangle showing the elevation of how people can connect with museums from public, then becoming audience, visitors, user, and then becoming participants. While James touched about cultural permission policy because his collection is not just about, um, you know, it's, it's not, I wouldn't say simple or complicated, but there is a context of taonga, means treasure, means anything prized. So there, is, there should be like a, a conversation with the community who sees this object as something, something prized. And then Madavi in the mixing the art, it's really interesting how um, you presented uh, how the user is having all the kind of authority in, in re remixing and reformatting the available art and make it into whatever they, they want, which is kind of um, kind of uh, kind of concern me a bit. What is the limit of the remixing later on? While Hillman with the with the audio, this is um, totally um, move from the physical object itself, like touching the content of the object. There is the object and you digitalize it and you research it and then you understand about the content and the story, but then the focus is about the story of it. So much somewhat detached, the focus of, um, of, 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 the, of the initiative becoming not about the physical object, but about the story. So 
that kind of relates with what Francisca was um, saying about this is not about talking of something that was made or discussed or um, created or visualized 100 years ago, but what can you take out of something that was made 100 years ago? So this is a really, you guys really, this is a really, really great presentation and you were like, uh, touch each other's subject and this is really interesting and I have questions. <laughs> so this one question, this is for all of you. Um, basically, there's the human factor in creating all of this, right? Although uh, Hilman was saying that the museum is a producer, but still there's the human factor, right? Choosing which, which, um, which stories that will be um, interesting to people. Like there is one program that um, the, the weekend in the museum that Hilman's team made, it was a story of one of our great hero uh, from Java War, 19th century. The story was told by the horse of the hero. And the object that is connected is the saddle of the horse. So that's like a total detachment of the object itself. There is no voice of the, there is no voice of the community related to the saddle. There is no voice of the historian. No, this is the, the voice of the horse. Right. So first of all, to Francisca, did I say it correctly? Francisca, I hope so. Uh, okay. So Francisca, I would like to ask your opinion in relation to James' presentation, right? There's the cultural permission policy and there's the, the aspect of protecting the Taonga. Where would this community will be in that pyramid? Are they the audience? Are they, can they be participants? Or they can just be owners? And how would be like the permission would, you know, would function in that. And after Francisca, if Madafi can, can, can continue about this permission, the original artwork, what is the limit of permission? How people can creatively remix all of this? And, and that, for James, can you also explain to us um, why the use of the Maori language is very, like, everywhere in, in your... <laughs> In, in, in New Zealand cultural uh, institution, in museums, in, 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 the, in, the, in your presentation, even in the basic concept, like there is like a strong kind of presence of ownership. So even the object is not owned by the museum, someone else is owning this, 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 um, this object. So if you can explain to us after Madafi on this kind of data ownership really owns it. And then Hilman, I would like you to kind of um, chip in on telling us how um, when you talk about the museum has to relate and relevant with the latest situation. Museum have to share authority while we know living in Indonesia and in Southeast Asia, those two things are really something foreign in, in our museums. So how us as an Indonesian, as we are the public, the audience, we are the user and the participant in the museums, how can we actually interact or persuade the museum to further produce these co-creative or opening the gate for co-creation because so far i think um only very limited you know limited people can can do what your team can do so francisca can you start yes thank you um hi everyone i hope my internet allows to understand me is it okay
Okay, I'll just go ahead and hope um, you can follow and it's not too laggy. Um, so following Anisa's question, thank you. Um, I'm, I don't have personal experience in working with source communities. Um, and I think really, so I'll leave this part to James. But I think what is really important is to think about working with people instead of about or for the collections. It's first of all, maybe a technical process. It's a process that is pointing at data. It's pointing at collections management. All collection databases are really about, you know, having an overview of what you have there, right? And then when you start, um, working with this data you first of all realize that um, a lot of these stories that are so important are not really recorded in the database that the museum perspective or material the, um, all other kinds of information but also that the circumstances under which these objects were collected are not really recorded well and as you said um maybe these objects were taken from people. So the ownership is a, is, a, is a question that needs to be discussed again and is discussed um, at the moment in many museums. And um, one of the keywords is decolonization. So I think here we really need to, um, but yeah, as you said, ownership and how we can work with people but use this idea actually for all forms of um, uh, ideas how we can you know invite people to use them but they're very specific and i think this also came through in medavi's examples and also in hillman's um, examples that you really um there are a lot of different um audiences and interests and and I think the first step would always people and then, you know, really tailor your offers um, and what you can do to these different interests. And I answer and I'm handing over, I think uh, James was next or Medavi, I'm not sure. I, I can answer the, um, the question. So. Um, so if I just understand the question correctly, it was first about the Māori language and its presence um, in, in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and in, you know, the glamour situations and things. And then secondly, um, around the ownership of, of items in the museum. So um, I think the first thing to note is that uh, I'm not Māori myself, and so I speak uh, as a Pākehā. And, you know, uh, with understanding that uh, New Zealand has a long colonial history. Um, we were, New Zealand was colonised by the British in the 1840s um, and Auckland Museum was as a colonial institution and, you know, was part of that sort of network of, of empire where um, people went around all around the world collecting objects and taking them from communities, you know, there may have been some purchase, there may have been some sort of more nefarious ways in which, which material was collected. These made their way back to, some of these made their way back to Auckland Museum and a lot of Māori uh, cultural items made their way to museums all around the world. So there's, you know, just to use the example of the, the cultural permissions, there's, there's, there's items and, and types of items that we would not show on our catalogue because they are considered to be tapu or sacred. But for example, you can go onto the British Museum web, website in their catalogue and, and you can find these and these have CC by licences underneath them. Now there's obviously not much that we can do about that in, in, in the New Zealand context, but we can do we kind of do what we can do with our own collections. Uh, in terms of the language, uh, since the 1970s in New Zealand, there has been a recognition by the New Zealand government around some of uh, the past wrongs. Um, there's been a very slow process of um, conciliation and of trying to understand uh, what happened uh, when colonisation occurred in New Zealand. And the language was banned, was, you know, was, was outlawed in colonial New Zealand, but it was one of the factors that kind of made a huge resurgence from the sort of 1970s onwards and is very much considered another treasure, another taonga. So it's part, I guess it's part of the, the cultural renaissance of Māori, it's part of uh, New Zealand 
kind of coming to terms with some of its past. And it's also part of, um, you know, to be honest, a, a legislative focus. We live in a bicultural country uh, under legislation with the Treaty of Waitangi that guides the way that public organisations should, should work. Um, and then just going back to the, the permissions and around who owns things. So we, we have a, a really detailed kind of cultural permissions process. If someone wants to access um, objects, then we go back to the source communities. If we've identified them, we haven't always identified who they are. But one of the things that we have been doing is um, over the last four or five years is some really big cataloging projects um, around the Taonga Māori collection and around our Pacific collection, where we've actually brought community members into the museum brought the sort of broad collection objects out and we've got experts to come in and to catalog these items using indigenous names, using the sort of the stories and what they were and how, how we use them. So that we're trying to, I mean, that we're decolonize, sort of to slowly decolonize, decolonize museum practice and also decolonize um, our museum database because it's, it's deeply entwined with those sort of those colonial relationships. So we've got a long way to go, but we are sort of making small steps um, towards that. Right. Thank you, um, James. That was really insightful um, and very ins inspiring also, I think, as an example for everyone here. Um, I think the question that Anissa, you asked me was around uh, the license, right? If I'm not wrong. Well, not just the license, um, also about, you know, the originality of the art, like the original artists have an intention to create one work and how would that work when people are remixing depends on what they want right uh, i think um a lot of the uh, 13 artworks that were released um were very they were all very varied uh, first of all and yes uh, the artist creates one piece uh, it's, it's supposed to be special um, but also art is meant to be consumed by a lot of people and how they take it in, how they uh, converse with it is something um, that's an ongoing thing. Like, yes, we used to go to galleries and see these things and see the artworks and that is one thing, but making them open, making them reusable is not um, disrespecting that artist in any way. It is just, it is just, um, it is just, enabling a new conversation um, that he started, I feel. Um, a lot of the works that were also, some of the works that were released were also prints uh, that artists had created. So for example, in India, there was an artist who created a uh, documentation of the great famine and um, these were meant for mass circulation. And I think if we work around something like that and, and, and um, just sort of use it to talk about causes that we believe in or just anything and really add to it it just sort of reaffirms the artist's aim originally so it's it, it can be something that we are just adding on to the conversation um for DAG also I think um, initially uh, when they wanted to release the collections there was a question around non-commercial use so uh, CC by NC um but but again the conversation with Europeana and the whole idea of give it up really helped us understand that it might be, and it would be definitely better if not a CC zero, uh, like a complete open access, at least the least that the museum could go ahead with would be a CC by SA. So again, to reaffirm that entire um, goal of creating that culture of creation. Uh, also in India, we as a public, for the first time, I think even in our research, it showed that a lot of people were not aware of the licenses earlier. So it's like you see something on social media, you think you can use it and you can just sort of recirculate it, um, but you can't remix it. You can't, you can't do much with it. And even then people do, people do just put off something from Facebook, add their own lines, make a meme out of it and share it ahead with no licenses. So there was this whole conversation about how is it different uh, by putting a license there. So I think this has opened up a lot of conversations in India for us around licenses it's, it's in itself. and. Um, how public domain artworks are seen. A lot of Indian art is already in the public domain, but it needs to be licensed and, and needs to be sort of free from 
um, any kind of uh, watermarks that museums put over all of this. And for that, I think a CC by SA at the very least or CC by zero is a dream come true so that everybody can use it in whichever way they want to use it. They want to print it, put it on their walls, gift it, use it for education. It should be just allowed for anything. Is, is that, did I answer you? I hope I answered your question. Thank you, Madafi. Yeah. Bye. Oke, okay, baik Kakak Ica uh, menjawab pertanyaannya. Mudah-mudahan saya tidak menyalah buk apa, tidak menangkap salah pertanyaannya. Yang pertama soal uh, sharing authority. Yang pertama adalah saya mensyukuri bahwa ada banyak sekali inisiatif-inisiatif warga di Twitter, di Instagram membentuk komunitas-komunitas yang ini tentu saja memperkuat posisi tawar warga publik. Uh, dan inisiatif seperti ini perlu kemudian didorong terus uh, oleh siapapun. Warga perlu berorganisasi, warga perlu men mengkonsolidasi, dan seterusnya. Yang kedua, kalau sudah ada, ya kita tahu, kita paham bahwa museum adalah salah satu sektor yang sulit sekali untuk uh, terbuka kepada publik, mungkin ya. Yang bisa kita lakukan adalah warga mari klaim aja. Me me merebut kembali ruang-ruang yang ada di museum, kalau memang misalkan tidak diizinkan untuk menggunakan tempat, tidak diizinkan untuk menggunakan koleksi, tidak membuka koleksi digitalnya, toh yang ada di museum itu kan cuma bendanya. Tapi informasinya terserak di mana-mana, dan itu adalah salah satu cara kita, cara warga untuk mereclaim uh, apa, space di museum. Dan jangan lupa, uh, sebenarnya nggak semuanya harus punya teknologi mahal ya. Podcast, podcast seperti yang saya bilang tadi, uh, tentu saja cara yang mudah sekali dan murah sekali untuk uh, me me membuat konten, tidak membutuhkan apa-apa yang sangat so yang sangat rumit gitu ya. Uh, terus. Uh, ada banyak sih sebenarnya komunitas yang sudah sustain ya. Uh, 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 Indo arkeologi misalkan sudah bisa itu membuat konten sendiri. Habis itu ada platform-platform untuk konten uh, creator, untuk uh, membuka dukungan warga terhadap konten creator untuk membuat kontennya, untuk memproduksi kontennya. Itu juga bisa untuk kemudian di Uh, manfaatkan oleh par, oleh warga untuk komunitas warga oleh organisasi warga jadi itu adalah beberapa cara yang harus uh, yang bisa mungkin ya dipakai untuk mereclaim uh, space kita space warga di museum dan yang paling utama kalau menurut saya sih engage aja dulu gitu ya kita mana tak kita nggak tahu uh, apa posisinya bagaimana semua kesalahpahaman, prasangka dan macam-macam kan disebabkan dari ketiadaan komunikasi nggak ada engagement antara warga dengan uh, pengelola dan mungkin saling berburuk sangka dan karena itulah ya udahlah kita sikat aja yang penting uh, ngomong aja dulu gitu mudah-mudahan menjawab kakak Ica Thank you, Hilman, and thank you, um, um, everyone, to answer. I'm learning a lot, and I'm for sure all of the audience that uh, who are here with us today also learning so many new things. Um, and yeah, so just a little bit from Hilman saying, if we don't have access to the objects, we still have access to the stories. So basically, and limitless. I mean, we, we can do everything. Um, we have about another um, uh, 10 minutes. Uh, we have one question from the audience and I will just read it and you guys can take turn to try to answer. This is from Rima Al-Hajmi. Question for any of the panelists, what effects does making your collections online have on visits, as in on your museum visits? And has any of online collections ever been used on a derivative work you kind of wish that it hadn't? Those two are among several discussion 
mentioned by CLAM institutions, private and state owned in Indonesia, when we were approaching them for partnership. So this is touch a little bit when I asked uh, Madafi, what is the limit of this remixing, right? They are afraid to make, uh, sorry, they are afraid that making their collections online would hinder people from visiting the museums directly and that some people would make disrespectful internet, internet meme, meme, meme out of their collection. So I would like uh, maybe, uh, maybe James can start um, because you're, you're handling with kind of like sensitive, more sensitive objects. And uh, maybe um, Francisca and Madafi kind of chip in on what you guys have had, you know, done in your previous projects to kind of, um, you know, on that concern. And Hilman, give me the insight of from the Indonesian Museum. Okay, go for it. Um, so just to answer those the bits of the question, I mean, in terms of the, the effect that making the collections online have had on visits, I don't think it's had a negative effect. We, we get around a million visit. We used to get a million visitors a year, but there's no tourists coming into New Zealand anymore. So those numbers have dropped off, but we're getting more local, local uh, tourists. Um, I, I don't think it makes a measurable effect. I think that there's, um, you can actually grow interest from people that want to see the objects, you know, on display. Um, so yeah, I think I, I, I've heard that argument before, but I'm not entirely convinced by that. The other point to make about that is that, you know, during the first lockdown here in New Zealand, we had to shut the museum down for only the second time in its history. But because we had our collections online, people could still connect with the Taonga, connect with the objects and connect with the museum. We didn't have to scramble around to get everything sort of sorted out. So it actually, you know, worked quite well in that situation. Um, in terms of the policy, I mean, I just don't think anyone should be making sort of policy on the basis of, you know, these very small exceptions. If you're going to release content, it should be for a kind of public good rather than being afraid that someone's going to use it in a bad way. Um, and saying that you need to be comfortable with the material that you're that you're releasing. And so that's why we do have our cultural permissions policy around the objects that we wouldn't like to see people making memes out of. Um, and, you know, so we've been more cautious with various, you know, various parts of the collection. Um, but, you know, from a personal point of view, I think it would be great if people were making memes from our collections, you know, like they're putting the time and the effort in and it's another form of engagement. So we would encourage that for the most part, for the most part. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll add uh, just a few words to this. Um, I, I fully agree that it is a different thing to work, for example, at home or a meme than visiting a museum. And I think there's a lot of research that a social event that you go to together with your friends, your family, but the engagement with the object is quite different. Also, we uh, when we set up an, an exhibition, there's a story, we, um, and so I think it's really important to make a case for these different situations and these different engagements. Um, and yeah, as James said, we have to be careful with the content we put online. There are some things that might not be um, the swastika is something we don't publish in museums and that's important and I think that's the best way to kind of letting go and giving control to others because we are controlling so much of this like we as museums Madafi. Right. So I think um, about the effect on visits, my, my view is that as we are moving towards, we're talking about museums being digital. So I think the aspect of a digital visit should become a metric. So um, whether or not it has 
an impact on more or less vis physical visitors walking through the door. My opinion would be that another metric to be proud of would be that how many people downloaded your work, how many people came to your website, how many, because the idea is that how many people became aware about your collection and your museum, that's the end goal, right? So whether they became aware by walking in through the door or seeing it online, I, I, I think um, that is something to twist our perspective over. Um, the other thing is that, yes, the second thing actually happened with us. Um, in fact, it was in my slides, the coloring page was of a mosque um, uh, in India, one of the one of the most uh, biggest ones uh, built in the Mughal period, historically very important. Uh, someone actually made a very offensive gif around it and we were sort of surprised to see it, but also not in this kind of climate that we operate in. Um, but we decided that it's up to the museum to see which reused artworks they further want to promote, not promote. Everybody has the right to create what they want to create out of um, the collection that you've opened. Um, for that one offensive, I, I think we had that one offensive um, gif and 105 positive, fun, really good ones. So again, we need to see that it's not like the conversation is only becoming negative and the art is only being used to, um, you know, be on a different propaganda level or anything like that. I think it's also generating positivity. And like James said, uh, we're happy for the engagement. Someone at least spent a lot of time exploring that wonderful piece of watercolor artwork, which was meant to highlight the architecture of the building. And um, yeah, I, I think that that's, that's something that it's, it's, it's a, it shouldn't hinder museums from opening up because there are a lot of positives to it. Right, thank you. Hilman? Hey, uh, saya setuju dengan Medafi bahwa tolak ukur keberhasilan museum itu juga tidak melulu pada kunjungan fisik, tapi bagaimana informasi pengetahuan yang dimiliki museum itu dikurasi kemudian disebarkan menjadi dinikmati oleh warga dan uh, harap diingat juga tidak semua orang suka museum tidak semua orang suka pergi ke museum tidak or semua orang uh, punya minat terhadap museum uh, dan seterusnya ada banyak sekali pasar atau audiens museum dan museum perlu memikirkan uh, mereka juga selama ini kan yang kita pikirkan yang mainstream aja tuh yang punya budaya visual tapi bagaimana yang punya budaya oral atau uh, budaya uh, auditif gitu ya budaya audio bagaimana yang suka mendengarkan nah itu yang diserve atau dilayani oleh museum seharusnya lewat podcast juga dan kita mana tahu ya ketika mendengarkan podcast museum misalkan di kereta wah menarik juga ya cerita ini mengenai koleksi ini habis itu dia minggu depan akan merencanakan dengan keluarganya untuk berkunjung ke museum tersebut. Jadi jangan berprasangka terlebih dahulu dan kalaupun kemudian koleksi digital atau apa itu kemudian di di disalahgunakan jadi ofensif, jadi menyerang, jangan khawatir dulu, santai aja gitu. Hadapi aja dengan humor dan uh, itu mungkin uh, salah satu resep Jangan terlalu serius lah museum gitu ya. Maksudnya apa yang kami lakukan itu kan di program akhir pekan di museum misalkan itu pendekatan humornya lega banget atau banyak sekali gitu ya. Teater Koma seperti biasa akan tampil dengan sangat humor dan yang paling unik adalah kita mampu melontarkan kritik-kritik sosial di museum pemerintah gitu ya untuk Uh, di, dinikmati oleh orang-orang semuanya terhibur dan itu kan cara menyenangkan ya jadi jangan takut dulu sih berbagi otoritas atau berbagi uh, konten informasi ke warga jangan underestimate warga gitu gitu aja sih right thank you Hilman <laughs> Hilman was saying uh, museum should just lighten up like don't be so serious. <laughs> um, well, well, thank you so much for this really amazing um, opportunity to 
um, to get to know your work and for us to learn um, so much, so many new things from you guys. And um, uh, I guess that's it for us uh, this session for today. Um, everyone stay tuned on the program. We will, stay, we will still have more conversations and workshops and discussion until the next three days. Um, thank you, James, Francisca, Madafi, Hilman. It's, it's, uh, it's a really, really great insight and it really, really help us, like especially Indonesian museums to learn, to learn more and maybe to be more relaxed on these things. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.